Good morning, beloved. I will be preaching in Pastor Larry's stead because uh, tomorrow is his arrival from the Holy Land, and of course we uh, anticipate his safe arrival with uh, the rest of uh, the GCF uh, congregation uh, who went there with him. So we continue with our study of Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 to 17. So I encourage each and every one to open their Bibles to that. Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 to 17. You can have any version of the Bible. We shall be reading out loud together, aloud together from uh, the NIV, which will be flashed here on our screens. But later on, when I preach the Word of God, it will be from the ESV, or the English Standard Version of the Bible. Now, in reverence for the reading of God's Word, shall we stand together as we read God's Word aloud together? Let's begin on verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. And may the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated, beloved. And in preparation for our sermon this morning, let's bow our heads and ask God for wisdom and to open our hearts to his word. Our Heavenly Father, we seek your face this morning, asking the Lord that your Holy Spirit imbue us with your wisdom and understanding. As we approach your word and study it together, may it speak to us, Lord, in truths that are easily accessible to us and practical enough for us to implement and practice as Christians in this world today. This we ask in the powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we continue with chapter 2, verse 12 to 17 of Revelation. Although the book of Revelation was written at about A.D. 95, its principles and truths are very much applicable to our situation today in the 21st century. The first two churches that were addressed in this book were the church at Ephesus, and the second was the church at Smyrna, which was uh, preached on last, uh, last week by Pastor BJ. Now, if there was a church that I would have loved to preach on, it would have been the church at Smyrna, because it's the church that literally the Lord had nothing against. And so here I am today preaching on a church where Satan's throne is. When I saw Pastor BJ last week, I was, I was asking Pastor BJ, Pastor BJ, I wish I, <laughs> I, I preached on your church. But as I was studying for this sermon, I suddenly realized the Lord changed my mind. Um, I, I'm very enthusiastic about preaching on the church at Pergamum now because there are so many things that I believe you and I will learn together today. All the letters to the seven churches had a lot of things in common. They all began with identifying the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a description of the Lord Jesus Christ unique to that church. And also, each of these letters have a commendation. They have a rebuke. Of course, the exception is the church at Smyrna. Uh, there's also words of encouragement for specific action. And each offers a promise to motivate godly behavior. The purpose of the letter to the church at Pergamum was to commend the Christians there for their past and their present faithfulness to Christ and to urge them to reject the false teachings that were predominant in their church. Now, there are three principles or truths that we shall be gleaning from verses 12 to 17, 
And from these three principles, we shall look at three very important implications for the body of believers here at GCF today. The first principle or truth we glean from our text is that the word of Jesus is a sharp two-edged sword. Verse 12 says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. The Lord Jesus Christ is identified here as the one who holds the sharp two-edged sword. Now, when you write a, a letter to a church, the best place to start is really to identify who Jesus is. Because who Jesus is to each and every one of us and to us as a congregation will determine the kind of response we have towards him, not only on an individual level, but as a corporate level as well, on a corporate level as well. So Jesus is identified as the one who has a sharp two-edged sword at the beginning of the letter, and at the, at the end of the letter, Jesus calls for repentance, and he warns that if they do not heed the call to repent, he will come and war, that is the word used in the ESV, war against them with the sword of his mouth. Now, we know that when Jesus does battle with the Antichrist, he will merely speak his word and he will annihilate the Antichrist and all his minions. But here, when the Lord Jesus Christ speaks of warring with the words of his mouth, because the context is in the church of Pergamum, the meaning is entirely different. And we will see what that meaning is. Now, when you see somebody walking down the streets here in Metro Manila and they're holding a sharp bolo or a sharp knife, you can't help but fear a little bit of fear, okay? The sword was used in the ancient world long before guns and grenades, and they were weapons because they could cut, they could cleave, they could slice, they could pierce, and they could sever, and they could ultimately kill. And in the hands of a Roman soldier during the New Testament times, the one holding the sword, this Roman, wielded power. He wielded the authority of the emperor, and he could wield that sword when commanded to, to impart Roman justice and to take life as well. The Roman gladius, that was the, the name of that sword, the Roman gladius, its, its blade was between 18 to 22 inches long, and it was a very, very sharp two-edged sword. Held in one hand, in the right hand particularly, the Romans held their, their shield in the left, and on the field of battle, the Roman soldier was a fearful adversary. He was trained to kill swiftly. He was trained to kill efficiently. efficiently. It was either fight or flight when you faced a Roman soldier. Now, knowing that Jesus, our Lord, is the one who holds a two-edged sword brings us to our first implication this morning. No one and nothing is hidden from God, and we are all to face Him to give account. If you have your Bibles, open to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. Let me read. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now, normally we'll stop there when we quote this verse. Why? We use it to inspire ourselves to study God's Word, to dedicate our lives to God's Word, and to obey God's Word. But let's continue with verse 13. What does it say? And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So in this context, beloved, we see that the Word of God is going to be used by God to judge us when we give an account of how we lived our lives. Beloved Christian, accountabil accountability is serious because the one that we are going to face is God. Unlike on the field of battle, 
When you face against a Roman soldier, you have the option to flee. Against God, there is no such option. But praise God. We who are already believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are not to be judged as to whether we will enter into eternity with Him. That was already settled beforehand by our faith in Jesus. John 3.16 promises us that we who believe in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. We are not going to perish. However, we still need to face the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. The NIV. So at the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to give an account of how we live our lives. And it's there that we could also, based on how we give an account, receive rewards and crowns. There are at least five crowns spoken of in the Bible that we can look forward to as faithful believers. The crown of righteousness for those who love the Lord's appearing. If you anticipate the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and you love His appearing, that crown is for you. The incorruptible crown is for those who discipline their bodies and who exercise self-control. I can think of a number of Christians already who, who, who will win this crown because of their self-discipline and their self-control. There's a crown of life for those who endure patiently through trials. Beloved, if you're going through trials and persecution, this crown awaits you. There's a crown of glory for godly leaders who were examples to the flock. And then there's the crown of rejoicing for those who win souls for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're enthusiastic about sharing your faith about the Lord Jesus Christ, sharing to unbelievers, this crown is something for you to look forward to. The Bible also refers, though, to a loss of rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Beloved, are we ready to face the judgment seat of Christ? What are we anticipating at that time? Are we anticipating reward or are we anticipating loss? I encourage each and every one of you to work for those crowns which are promised by the Lord Jesus Christ that we can receive at the judgment seat of Christ. Our first implication, no one and nothing is hidden from God and we are all to face Him to give an account. So are we living our lives in the knowledge that God sees everything we do? We should. We should. Our second principle, beloved, Jesus commands, Jesus Christ rather, commands those who conform to his word. Jesus Christ commands those who conform to his word. Verse 13, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Beloved, the world poses a challenge against our faithfulness to our Lord Jesus Christ. Pergamum was referred to by Christ as the seat or the throne of Satan because Satan, the great deceiver, was very comfortable there. In that city lived many who were under the deception of Satan, where there were temples, altars, shrines, which raised money through many elaborate feasts. 
and festivals, and they practiced sacred prostitution in that city. If there was a pagan city, it was Pergamum, and it participated in all sorts of perverse practices. And Pergamum was competing against Corinth as the sin city of the ancient world. Because of that environment, the Lord Jesus Christ empathized with the church at Pergamum because he knew how difficult it was to be a Christian in such a sinful and anti-Christian city. Beloved, God gives his commendation to those who hold fast and remain faithful despite persecution. One Christian in Pergamum that is mentioned here is Antipas, who was a faithful witness. Now, there is nothing else in the Bible that tells or describes Antipas other than what was said here. However, there is a tradition that says that he was a member of a medical guild called the Asclepians. Now, the Asclepians, in fact, worshipped the god of medicine. He was Asclepius. And Asclepius is in the form of a serpent. The, Asclepio, the Asclepium is a, a, a spa in, in those days where people would go to in order to be renewed physically and spiritually. And they would be given a drink or a concoction so that uh, in the night they, they would dream dreams and this God called Asclepius would speak to them in order to know how they would be treated. Antipas was sharing his faith secretly and he was being persecuted by members of the um, Asclepians. He was condemned to die because he did not acknowledge the divinity of Caesar and he was placed inside a copper bull under which they built a very strong fire and he was roasted to death. And yet, despite that painful death, he did not turn his back on his faith. He remained faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ and the church at Pergamum followed his lead and the Lord Jesus Christ commended them for it. Now, here in the Philippines, we see little risk of having to die for our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's still tempting for many to remain silent because it's easier to fit in rather than to stand out. But when we stand out, it's important that we persevere. I remember a story that was uh, told very, very often by my dad when he was uh, still active as a preacher. It was about a Christian who decided that he would do lifestyle evangelism at his place of work. In other words, um, whenever there was a party, he would be a teetotaler. He would absolutely deny himself uh, wine or, or beer. And so party after party after party, year after year after year, he would turn down offers of drinking uh, any alcoholic beverage. And his uh, co-workers recognized his self-discipline, and so they said, let's, let's create a plaque and give this plaque to him during the next party. So um, we're going to offer him another drink, and then when he refuses it, that's when we're going to give him his plaque. During that party, they were ready to give uh, the plaque. They were prepared it already, and so they offered him um, a, um, a bottle of beer. To their disappointment, he took that bottle of beer. Before taking a swig of it, he said, all right, just this once, <laughs> just this once, don't try to tempt me ever again, okay? <laughs> and so he drank from that bottle, and boy, the group was just so disappointed. They, they, uh, they gave him the plaque and showed, the, showed him the plaque that they wanted to give him. And when he received it and read it, he cried. He cried because he, he realized how much he had forgotten about his commitment and that he forgot to persevere and that he had ruined his witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Our second implication, beloved, perseverance in our faith in Jesus is necessary evidence of our salvation as believers. The flip side of perseverance is preservation. 
which indicates that our salvation is not so much our work, but God's work. What is evident on the external is our work, but internally what makes us work out our salvation is God. No, remember, Elder Dylan, did I just hear you're supposed to work out our salvation? Isn't salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone? Yes, it is, but it's a, chick, a chicken and egg thing. Our faith is the chicken. Our works are the eggs. Listen to what Philippians chapter 2, 12 and 13 says. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So, beloved, the working out of our salvation is what we are to do, but it is the result of God working in us to desire to do what is ultimately for his good pleasure. So, God saves you and me from sin, and he asks you and me to do good works in fear and trembling, but we are made capable of doing these good works because God is the one who in the first place is working inside you and me. Perseverance requires our obedience because our obedience is evidence of our inner renewal from God. What does James 2, 18 and 19 say? But someone will say, you have faith. I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. And in verse 26, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is that our faith must be evidenced by works. Otherwise, it is a dead faith. And a dead faith is not a saving faith. Let me repeat our second implication. Perseverance in our faith in Jesus Christ is necessary evidence of our salvation as believers. Our third principle. Christ condemns those who deviate from his word. Verses 14 and 15. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So from these verses, we see that the Lord is condemning the church at Pergamum because they were holding on to false teaching. They had, some of them had deviated from God's word and believed in false teaching and were practicing it. The first one, of course, was the teaching of Balaam or the way of Balaam. And from this, we see that wrong teaching is motivated by worldly and fleshly gain. Balaam, you see, was an Old Testament character, and you can read about him in... Um, in chapter 22 of Numbers, when Israel was about to attack the Moabites, when they had just uh, about to enter the promised land, the king of Moab called upon Balaam for he had a reputation that those he blessed would be blessed and those he cursed would be cursed. So messengers were sent to Balaam by the king of Moab bringing fees of divination. This was a talent fee, so to speak. Talent fee for pronouncing a curse upon Israel. But Balaam is prevented by God supernaturally. Instead of speaking curses, Balaam could not speak a curse against Israel. Instead, he spoke blessings upon the nation of Israel. He spoke four blessings, in fact. However, because he was so motivated by financial gain, he instead gives... King Balak of Moab counsel on how to weaken Israel. He gave King Balak a masamang balak. <laughs> okay. They were to use, or they were to mount a campaign of seduction by using Moabite and Midianite women to seduce the Israelites into sexual relationships and into pagan rituals. 
the Israelites who were lured into this sexual immorality, who also ate food, sacrificed to idols, and worshipped Baal, brought upon judgment on the nation of Israel. And those that were directly involved in this were commanded to be executed by God. All in all, 24,000 died during that day. What Balak could not do directly by engaging in battle, they were able to do through false teaching and false practice. Due to physical and spiritual immorality, the nation of Israel went under the judgment of God. We see that God condemns wrong teaching because it propagates sin. Now, the church at Pergamum were rebuked also for holding onto the teaching of the Nicolaitans. We don't know much about the teaching of the Nicolaitans, but we know that the church at Ephesus was commended because they also hated the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus Christ hated as well. They were likely a group similar to, um, to those who believed in the teachings of Balaam, though we're not sure about the exact practice. Clement of Alexandria says, however, that they abandoned themselves to pleasure like goats, leading a life of self-indulgence. Essentially, they perverted the teaching of grace. The teaching of grace frees us from the law, but they perverted it and taught that grace allows us to do anything we liked, and that's why they lived the life of licentiousness. And this brings us to our final implication, our third implication, beloved. The truth of God's Word is hard to carry out because it goes against our sinful nature, while falsehood is easy to succumb to because it appeals to our sinful nature. It is because of this that we are warned against false prophets, be precisely because they appeal to our sinful nature. And what were the weapons used against the Israelites? Food, sex. What, motiv what motivated Balaam? Money. These three things nowadays, beloved, are still being used by Satan through false teachers and false prophets to lure away believers and also to seduce non-believers and keep them unbelieving. We Christians, therefore, are to be on our guard because if Satan cannot take our souls because we are already saved, he can still spiritually weaken us by misleading us in believing in false teachers and false teaching. 2 Peter 2, 1 to 3, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed, and in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Question is, how can we spot false prophets and false teachers in our midst? Pastor John MacArthur of Grace to You Ministries identifies five characteristics of false teachers. Firstly, false teachers are proud. They're concerned for their own popularity. They're concerned for their own prestige. They want large crowds. They want to build mega churches. Secondly, false teachers are characterized by selfishness. They tend to be self-centered. They leverage their popularity for huge, to ask for huge donations from their congregations to support their lavish lifestyles. Thirdly, they're characterized by deceptions. False teachers tend to be very articulate. They're very good with speech. You're, you're automatically drawn to them when they open their mouth. They seem to say the right things all the time. They use diverse versions of the Bible to proof text or support their teaching or whatever it is they're asking from their own congregation. Fourthly, they're irreverent. They're often disrespectful in the way they talk about others and they show their prejudices. Oftentimes on their television shows, you'll see them cursing. 
They have little respect for the Word of God. They mistranslate it. They misquote it. They disregard its fundamental truths. And fifthly, they are spiritually destructive. They abuse and and use people, and they primarily lead people into error. Now, if there are two false teachings that are particularly destructive today, these are teachings that deny the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ and His being the only way to God the Father by faith in Him. And the second is the substitution of the gospel of grace that saves a sinner from sin with a gospel that emphasizes the promise of prosperity and financial well-being. The second teaching is called the prosperity gospel. It's so devious because it goes to the very heart of what many people want. Many people want a luxurious and comfortable lifestyle. One false teacher who teaches this is Creflo Dollar. I don't know if you're familiar with that name, Creflo Dollar. In 2010, he was one of six multimillionaire televangelists who was audited by the IRS to make sure that they were not abusing the tax-exempt status of their churches. His church, back in 2006, made $69 million. And his church provided him with a Rolls Royce. In Dollar's words, let me quote, Just because my life is excessive doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong, unquote. In March of this year, 2015, Dollar's old private jet broke down. And so now he's asking his congregation to fund the purchase of a new $65 million G650 jet. The project is called Project G650. And of course, he created a promotional video. It's on the internet. If you would like to look at it, you can search for it on YouTube. And he's convincing people to contribute, at least 200,000 people to contribute $300 or more to make this dream a reality. Of course, he's asking it in the name of God. According to Creflo Dollar, prayer is a tool to force God to grant prosperity. This is what he says. Let me quote, when we pray, believing that we have already received what we are praying for, God has no choice but to make our prayers come to pass. It is a key to getting results as a Christian. Beloved, the prosperity gospel is so popular in third world countries like the Philippines because it appeals to the masses who want to improve their lifestyle. Now, you might think that here in GCF, we're not at risk at believing the prosperity gospel. Oh, that's for people outside of GCF. It's not for evangelicals like us. Now, members of the Pasig Covenant Reformed Church went to the Manila International Book Fair at the SMX Convention Center, and they had a survey with them. It was a 12-question 12 uh, 12 survey. It had multiple choices. And on that survey, one of the statements that they asked the respondents to respond to was this. If you faithfully live for God, He will reward you with many blessings in this life. And the responses were, strongly agree, 71%. Agree, 7%. Somewhat agree, 7%. Disagree, 10%. Strongly disagree, 5%. This was among people who went to the Christian bookstore. And 85% of them agreed with this statement. Beloved, if you agree with this statement, then you are vulnerable to believing in the prosperity gospel. If you remember last week, Pastor BJ spoke at the church of the church at Smyrna. This was a poor church, yet it was spiritually rich. Beloved, this flies against the statement that if you faithfully live for God, He will reward you with many blessings in this life. James chapter 2, verse 5 also says, Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith? 
and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him. Beloved, our faith and the size of it is independent of the size of our bank account. And vice versa. Nothing has got to, one thing has got nothing to do with the other. Ultimately, we as believers need to be discerning of the truth, and we can only be discerning if we commit ourselves to the study of God's Word. We ask the Holy Spirit to lead us to its truths. We commit to believing in it, even if it is uncomfortable, because the Bible is not only there to comfort us when we feel uncomfortable, but it is also there to make us feel uncomfortable when we are already spiritually lethargic. Our last implication, the truth of God's word is hard to carry out because it goes against our sinful nature while falsehood is easy to succumb to because it appeals to our sinful nature. In conclusion, God exhorts each and every one of us to remain faithful to him and his word and he promises eternal blessings and reward for faithfulness and endurance. Verse 16 Therefore repent, if not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, when we as believers fall into wrong belief and practice and are condemned by the Lord Jesus Christ, it gives us an opportunity to repent. In the New Testament, the word repent comes from the Greek word metanoia, which literally means a change of mind, a change of mind. See, we cannot be expected to change our lives if internally our minds are not changed. Our behavior will not change if our minds, our thinking is not changed. That's why in Romans chapter 12, we're exhorted that we be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Verse 17, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on that stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Now, this is the last verse of our text, and verse 17 holds out a promise to the one who conquers. Who is this one who conquers? Well, in this context, it is someone who remains faithful to God in his word, despite persecution and wrong teaching. He is someone who perseveres in his faith, and he is someone who upholds right teaching and resists false doctrine. This person believes in God and spurns false teachers. He is someone who loves Jesus and his word. And what does Jesus promise this conqueror? Some of the hidden manna. In the same way that God supported and fed the Israelites in the desert with manna. Jesus will sustain this conqueror because he is the bread of heaven. Jesus also promises a white stone. Now, the white stone alludes to a Roman practice during Roman games. Victors were given a white stone with their names on it because they were invited to a special banquet in their honor. And so this white stone that Jesus is going to give conquerors is essentially an invitation to an eternal banquet, an eternal celebration in heaven. So beloved, in essence, Jesus is promising those who overcome entrance into his presence, into eternal celebration at an eternal banquet where Jesus Christ is there, the living bread the heavenly manna. Being a conqueror is part of our DNA, beloved. In fact, we are asked to be more than conquerors. And I'll read to you what it says in Romans chapter 8, 31 to 37. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also give him graciously, also with him graciously, give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. 
Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Let's bow our heads and pray, beloved. Oh Lord, we thank you that you have called us to be more than conquerors and that victory is assured because our victory is in Jesus Christ. Lord, help us live our lives in a victorious way. Help us, Lord, to become faithful to your word despite persecution. Help us, Father, to persevere in our faith in Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, by giving us discernment to know what false teaching is by our commitment to study your word. And help us, Lord, rebuke and resist wrong teaching and false doctrine. Lord, make us effective Christians in this world. Make us the kind of people you want us to be. Make us more than conquerors because you in Jesus Christ, loved us. This we pray in his name. Amen. Beloved, shall we all rise for our benediction. Our God, our Father, we ask you, Lord, to honor our wish to be a body of believers will be more than conquerors. And to you who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us blameless before the presence of your glory with great joy, to you, our only God, our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen and amen. God bless you all, beloved. Go in peace. Our elders and pastors will be here up front, and if you want them to pray for you, they will make themselves available for you. God bless you all.